I think the other one that you know, we touched on briefly is though is the, the ability to just, you know, look at developing nations and be able to, as cellular technology comes into those and allows them to communicate and we figure out ways to, you know, sort of this microfinance and other ways to empower developing nations to be more connected, mm -hmm. just come to the access to the data and be more connected to the rest of the world. I think that could be very disruptive. It's like there's huge Hugely. numbers of population is not connected right now. And what happens? when that becomes more possible for that. Yeah, and when you think about knowledge workers too, because the, the cost of a knowledge worker in one of those developing countries, if they have simply the, the connectivity that we're talking about, their cost to deliver their brain power to you is lower than someone who has a mortgage that exists in now. Bellevue, Washington. It exists and now. so yeah. you're starting to see that there is going to be a lot of uh, competition for building things. And with this distributed network of tools, all of a sudden you could have someone in Honduras that costs you less, but they're living a great lifestyle. Exactly. And they're contributing meaningfully to your project, the same as someone who's sitting in two houses. You, you've, to your point, I, I, I see it happening today. We've seen it for years in outsourcing in, in high tech. The ability now for me to actually farm out a job, and that job could be today something which I only trust to a particular person with a particular degree from a particular school to do a particular level of quality work. The fact that I can now, out, I can now farm out that job and have it broken up into pieces and then handled by multiple folks across the world and reassembled on the back end to a complete project, I, I think that to me is the most trans transformative uh, technology I think we'll see in the next n number of years because it is it, it, it will transform not just the way in which we, we work here in developed countries, but it will transform economies in nations that today don't necessarily have the, 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 the profit that we, uh, that we enjoy here in the U.S. in these developed markets because we'll be employing so many of their, of their people who have skills and knowledge uh, to, to accomplish things that we think today are only accomplishable by those with, with degrees from certain schools. I think that is the fundamental challenge for, for America, quite honestly, because you know, if we are going to be competitive, we've got to do it in a way that we can harness this power without seeing it as a threat. Like everyone is fearful of offshoring. But I mean, startups don't think of it as offshoring. They think of it as having a virtual team. There's lots of smart people all around the world. We're all connected together in this internet. And we really need to be the ones who can synthesize this and turn it into something that everybody wants. <laughs> also, I feel like taking some of the technology that we do and some of the stuff we've done at our company is how do we bring up some of these, empower and sort of connect some of these other, this rest of the world. Did a great work for this company out of Bay Area called Simpa Networks where, you know, how do you provide solar power? They can't afford it, but how do you make it so that they can get a text message on the phone, unlock their solar power panel for some amount of time, and then each time they keep incrementally keep owning that. Pretty soon, now, you know, they've got case studies where you know, these guys are running sewing machines and now their lives are better because now they've been able to incrementally buy this power and be able to run their sewing machines or have light to do their work by, you know. It's really cool and it's just by really simple technology from our perspective, like how do we create this device that they can input a text message that unlocks it, it's a simple, some yeah. simple controller, yeah. but we did that and now understanding what the user and how they pay for things and match that up, it's enabled this whole Essentially, whole populace to be able to now have power. That's where I think it's technology is most transformative. Not to necessarily flip the conversation on its ear, but I think the value of education is so transformative in how, traditionally speaking, traditional models. You know, you have a teacher and a student, and then with the ability to pen or to communicate in, in writing, which can be Repli uh, replicated by way of a, uh, like a printing press, you have the ability to spread the word with access to this global database of information can be transformative, whether you're accessing it from this country, that country, or another. And that creates a, uh, 
a non-geopolitical boundary which should have governments trembling because governments and geopolitical boundaries have been predicated on a model of control. And the internet in the digital world is almost the antithesis of control. And that is what has most governments trembling. Education is the, I think, uh, it's the linchpin. It's a great it, example of that Afghanistan girl, right? You know, modern education. It doesn't take much to get a story out there anymore. You cannot stem the tide. You can't stick your thumb in the dike. You cannot keep it from happening. And that is where it starts to change. This is, it's a slow process because we have to still deal with traditional constructs and institutions, uh, regulations, and that I think is going to slowly erode. Well, I think, you know, there's two things that are kind of interesting listening to what you guys are saying. Um, one of them is, you know, I've been doing a little bit of um, work covering the Gates Foundation and this idea of knowledge, like you're talking about, Chris, and how more of it's available than ever before. And now we're talking about malaria and how can people in developing countries have toilets? I mean, these are, these are the types of things we're talking about, right? Yeah. Here in Seattle, when that wasn't happening 10 years ago, I mean... We didn't have toilets? I think... <laughs> <laughs> we weren't talking about these... I think I, I had one. But I think this idea of knowledge and a connected world, which is even a higher level than what Chris was saying, is, um, you know, it, it's so obvious to us, but it's really fun to look back and see that, like, all of a sudden we're talking about malaria when it's not a problem yeah. in the U.S. Sure, well, That's cool. And we're actually helping them. Like, we're yeah. understanding it. We're keeping in touch with them in a better way. Yeah. We're, we're yeah. seeing their life like we've never seen it before. That's really exciting to me. And the fact that we have all this momentum behind it. We actually care more than we have before because we're part of their lives. The other thing that stood out to me is TV, and I think one of the things there, you know, kind of coming from working in that industry for a little while, is this idea of cutting out the middleman or making it's, the middleman more important than they've ever been before. Yeah. So if, if you're there and you're not serving a purpose, like you're just literally rebroadcasting the information, you okay. might be gone in a couple years. Well, I think, I think there's something that's afoot, and it's not self-enlightened to say this, but I think it is interesting. You know, we, we had Napster come along and disrupt the music industry in a big way, and... Um, you know, as soon as, you know, bandwidth is good enough that stealing something of substantial size is easy and sharing it with friends and stuff, um, it becomes disruptive to an industry. And one of the industries that really hasn't been completely, you know, messed up yet is the TV and video yes. industries. Um, we now wait for the, our, our dose of whatever the TV industry wants to serve us to get it. Uh, we get it on their terms. And you know now that bandwidth is getting to be so high, storage is getting to be so cheap, the ability to instantaneously access, whether it be legally or illegally, content means that you don't have a catalog of things in a two-dimensional grid called the TV guide that you can watch and kind of flip through you know, 500 channels, 450 of which you would never watch probably in your lifetime, 50 of which you might, but only at certain times of the day. Now you can dial all that content in. It's just fascinating to me what is happening. And so it's going to drive down consumers' interest in this thing called cable TV and satellite TV potentially if they don't get hip with the program. And you'll be able to a la carte just sort of say, this is what I like to watch. This is how much I'm willing to pay for it. And look, you know, there's this real threat that if you don't come to me with the type of consumption patterns I'm interested in, bandwidth is getting high, con you know, storage is cheap, you know, what happened with Napster and the music industry could well happen to the video industry. It's happening and a now, very, though. It's happening now, but it hasn't quite yet yeah, hit. Yeah, I agree with that.